All right, welcome everybody. Uh, I am Matt Ayers. I'm a professor of biological sciences, a member of the Dartmouth graduate program in ecology, evolution, environment, and society, and associate director of the Institute of Arctic Studies within the Dickey Center for International Understanding. It's my great privilege today to introduce for a seminar and discussion the uh, Honorable Francis Ulmer, Senior Fellow of the Harvard Belfer Center. Uh, I'd like to begin by recognizing and acknowledging that the land on which we call Dartmouth is the traditional and unceded territory of the Abenaki people and the Wabanaki Confederacy prior to their forced removal. These lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. We honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people still connected to this land on which we gather for our work and learning. This event is sponsored by the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding and the Institute of Arctic Studies. It has been made possible by the class of 1950 and is a contribution of the university University of the Arctic Institute for Arctic Policy. So our guest today, Frances Ulmer, uh, is a senior fellow at Harvard's Belfer Center. She has served in a variety of capacities, including chancellor of the University of Alaska Anchorage, Alaska's Lieutenant Governor, state legislator, mayor of Juneau, professor, lawyer, research director, uh, Special Advisor to the State Department on the Arctic and Chair of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission. She has undergraduate and law degrees from the University of Wisconsin and has been a visiting professor at Stanford and at Harvard's Institute of Politics. She's lectured internationally on Arctic issues from uh, Antarctica to the North Pole. Uh, so those parts I had to write down uh, what I didn't write down because I didn't have to is uh, that about one pandemic ago, I had a chance to work with Fran in Iceland for a week where we were both lecturers on a joint trip with alumni from the University of Wisconsin and Dartmouth College. And during our time together, I found myself regularly impressed by how Fran was able to see and explain crucial dimensions of the Arctic that had previously been invisible to me. So we invite you to engage with Fran today. There will be time after her presentation for your questions and discussion. Uh, you can type questions anytime into the chat, into the, the Q&A button that you'll see floating around on your Zoom screen someplace. Uh, the discussion period after the talk will be moderated by my colleague, Melody Brown Birkins, Associate Director of the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding and Adjunct Professor of Environmental Studies. The title of Fran's talk will be Winners and Losers from Rapid Arctic Change. Thank you so much for being here, Fran. Well, thank you so much for the invitation and thank you for a truly delightful introduction. Let me see if I can pop up my screen here. I've had the opportunity to be at Dartmouth a few times and I've enjoyed your hospitality every time and really appreciate the work that is being done there on Arctic work. From the faculty and students and staff, uh, not only because it's a topic that I enjoy talking about, but because Dartmouth is a very special place. So I am assuming that there are people on this call who know a lot about the Arctic and maybe a few that don't. And so I'm gonna start with a couple of basic slides reminding us what the Arctic is and why it is so special. So this is a place that has really attracted a great deal of attention with not always complete understanding of what makes this place so unique. Yes, it's an ocean surrounded by eight countries. And yes, there are 4 million residents there. And yes, there are specialized ecosystems associated with the high latitude region of the Arctic. But it is also a place with really complicated cultures. 
a history of really diverse exploration and science and, and different economies that have evolved there that really make it a puzzle for many people. What makes it even more of a puzzle is how rapidly it's changing, because if you knew anything about the Arctic in the 20th century, you have to update it because the 21st century Arctic is really an entirely different place. And we're going to explore just a little bit about how some of those changes are really stunning in their rate, but also in terms of their impact. So we're seeing consistently higher temperatures and much higher than global averages. And commensurate with that, we are seeing reductions in sea ice, which has a big impact on an area that is predominantly an ocean surrounded by land. The sea ice decline, as I'm sure you have read, is really dramatic. And it is possible for us to see it because of the way in which we can now visualize the reduction and we see over these last 30 or 40 years, about a 50% reduction in extent and about a 75% reduction in terms of volume. The ice is thinner, there is less multi-year ice, and that also has big implications. And I just wanna say we are so completely outside of the bounds of what has historically been the Arctic, at least in human times, uh, that it's kind of hard for humans to get their heads around the rate of this change. We're also seeing land ice in de decline, both in terms of the Greenland ice sheet, in terms of glaciers, whether you're talking about Alaska or any place else, it is really kind of sad. I mean, this glacier, the Mendenhall Glacier in Juneau, Alaska, many tourists have seen it because you can drive to it. And it is stunning how much less of it there is today than when I moved to Alaska almost 50 years ago. The other kind of land ice of interest in the Arctic is of course is permafrost, the permanently frozen ground that covers almost a quarter of the Northern hemisphere, which is quite surprising to people actually. And we're seeing the top layer thawing further down every summer. Again, it depends a lot on where you are, but it is pretty consistently the case across the Arctic. And we are also seeing changes in the ocean, not just the sea ice retreat, but it's becoming fresher in some places. It's becoming more acidic because the ocean has absorbed a lot of the excess carbon dioxide that humanity has pumped out over the last hundred years. Um, and that is changing conditions for the creatures of the ocean. So all of these changes, not surprisingly, means that there are winners and losers as a result of change. That's true kind of in, in everything in life. Not all change is bad, not all change is good. And if we look at various pieces of the Arctic in terms of ecosystem, plants and animals, the people of the Arctic, I will discuss briefly just as a few examples of how some are doing better and others are doing not so well. And also I'll talk a little bit about the implications for people beyond the Arctic, for ecosystems beyond the Arctic. And I'm going to do this in a relatively compressed period of time today. So some of these things I'll have to cover rather briefly. But if we are looking at the ecosystem changes impacting species, we see that many species of the Arctic, not just the walrus and the polar bear, but many are in a very rapid rate of change. And some of them are winners and doing better, and some of them aren't. Uh, here are just a few examples. So bowhead whales actually so far are winners. Uh, the numbers are increasing in the Beaufort and the Chukchi. We are seeing whales doing very, very well. Again, largely because of the upwelling of krill and copepods. But uh, the cod, not so much. The Arctic cod took a big dive during that warm period of the North Pacific about five or six years ago that we euphemistically called the blob. Uh, they, their numbers took a big dive, but a number of uh, the trawl surveys are showing them, showing them showing up further north. And so 
they may do fine as they move to colder waters. Seabirds and shorebirds have had a very hard time because not only the warmer water, but the change in their food has really created significant die-offs all along the coast of Alaska, but not just Alaska. And the caribou also have been having serious problems because of the freeze thaw that is now being experienced in a lot of the Arctic, which means that you get an ice cover over the snow that the caribou and the reindeer used to be able to dig through to get to their lichens. Um, that is creating, in some cases, mass starvation events. So that's just a real brief snapshot of a few of the species. How about the people who live in the Arctic? And as I mentioned, there are many cultures and many rich traditions associated with living in the Arctic. And again, it depends upon where you are, but just a few examples from the Inupiat and the Yupik culture of the Alaska region, which is quite similar to the Inuit of, of Canada, uh, food security and the reliance on the plants and animals of the Arctic is a very important part of, yes, food security, but also of the culture. The culture of many of the indigenous people of the Arctic, so closely tied to the land and the waters, the sea mammals, the seabirds, the fish, the whales that they have relied on for centuries for food, for well being, for language, for culture. And the changing conditions mean that they have to adjust. So in recent years, we have seen changes that impact the way in which people harvest. So I mentioned before that Beaufort, in the Beaufort and Chukchi, the bowhead are doing very well, but they're much farther offshore, which means for the Inupiat whalers, they can't go out in their small boats to where the ice edge is, where the bowhead whale are trans is transiting. So even though there are more of them, uh, there have been years where they can't get to them. Another example is reindeer herders in Russia. And this past winter, the problems associated again with this freeze thaw and the icing conditions that really produced for them a food security issue as well. It's not just about food, it's not just about harvesting, it's also about the safety of their villages and their infrastructure. Again, this is particularly true in places like along the coast of Alaska, the northwest coast of Alaska that is being hit by storms in ways that previously the ice was a blanket on top of the sea. And so these really big fall and winter storms didn't create the kind of wave action that they now do, eating away the shoreline and creating in a combination of these waves and permafrost thaw, coastal erosion that is really dramatically impacting their infrastructure, such that many communities now are facing the need to move. They are relocating. Shishmaref, Nutak, Kivalina, there are at least three dozen communities that are in various stages of either in the process of moving, planning to move, trying to decide where to move to, or will need some sort of reinforcement in order to be safe in their community. But it's not just villages. This change in the systems of the Arctic also impacts urban infrastructure. It impacts pipelines and roads. It impacts buildings across the Arctic where there's permafrost that used to be like a cement concrete foundation, hard and predictable, is now more unpredictable, more like sand, creating instability. So these are issues that really go to the safety and the ability of humanity in the Arctic to continue as they have. Now, let me switch to what some of the Arctic changes that I've been talking about. What does that mean to people beyond the Arctic, people who live anywhere in the world, particularly along coastlines, but literally anywhere? 
So there are a few ways in which Arctic change really is impacting global climate and global conditions. And I'll give you just a couple of examples. One is warming. You have to sort of think of the Arctic as the planet's air conditioner. It contributes dramatically to the cooling process because of the white ice at the top of our planet being able to reflect solar radi radiation. Well, as it, we lose ice, we get more dark surfaces, blue water, land with less snow on it, which means more warmth being absorbed, which means our air conditioner is kind of losing some of the power that it's had to help cool our planet. So this is one way in which Arctic warming is certainly impacting global conditions. Another is in the way in which the Arctic is contributing to destabilizing the strength of the jet stream. Now, the science on this, of course, is still evolving because this is a relatively new phenomenon. But as the Arctic warms, it has the effect of creating these unpredictable weather patterns or at least contributing to them. You know, if you think about the jet stream that used to be sort of like a donut and now looks sort of more like a snake because of the pre the Basically, the temperature differential is not as stable between the cold north and the warmer mid latitudes. So you are getting unpredictable weather and you are getting longer periods of cold, longer periods of warm, of drought, of rain, of conditions. And we saw that quite recently this spring with the extreme cold temperatures that areas in say Texas and other places we're experiencing. We talk about it in terms of the polar vortex, but this is again, another impact of a warmer Arctic on global conditions. There was recently an article in the New York Times about how a warmer Arctic and the melting of Greenland ice may be contributing to the destabilization also of currents that have kept a more stable climate in the North Atlantic region. And of course, we know that a warmer Arctic and the melting of both glaciers, the retreat of glaciers and the Greenland ice sheet is contributing to sea level rise. So again, the impacts of these changes are not just felt in the Arctic. These Arctic changes go global. And that is an important thing for us to remember, the extent to which what is happening in the Arctic has implications for people, regardless of where they live. You know, we, we think about all the coastal cities in the world. I mean, millions, billions of people who live close to the ocean. And we know that the projections about exactly how fast the sea level rise will actually impact communities. We're not sure, but you know, most conservative estimates say about a meter by the end of this century. And you know, there are places like Miami Beach that will suffer as a result of that, but we don't have to wait that long. I mean, there are many communities, important communities, like this naval station in Norfolk, Virginia, that are already experiencing flooding that requires investment and prevention and protection for critical infrastructure. And I don't care what coast you're on, whether you are in California or whether you are in Maine, we are seeing the sea level rise impacts already creating conditions that require communities, individuals, states, countries to take affirmative action to not only plan and adapt, but also to take action to try to slow the rate of climate change and hopefully slow the rate of the way in which Arctic warming is contributing to changes globally. Uh, this was kind of interesting. I noticed that the Natural Resources Council of Maine was actually downscaling these models enough to be able to do a better job of predicting which communities really are the most at risk. And there are many states that are taking this approach, which is important. So most of what I've just talked about sounds kind of like loss, loss for communities, loss for businesses, potentially loss of life, and certainly loss of the stability that we have been fortunate enough 
to experience than that humanity, at least in the last few centuries, has been able to count on weather being mostly predictable. So are there any winners associated globally with the changes that are coming from a warmer Arctic? There's speculation about this particular arena, and that is that there's like a brand new ocean. And as we know, humanity frequently wants to move to new frontiers and find new opportunities. And an, an Arctic Ocean with less ice seems to be more accessible. And not only you know, are there resources there, but there's more technology that leads people to think that it may be possible to do more development in the region in a safe way. So what kind of development are we talking about? Well, these are the things that are most frequently talked about, shipping, fishing, tourism, mining. Let's explore just a few of those and think about who might be winning and who might be potentially losing from that kind of additional activity. Shipping, yes, if you go to any Arctic conference, you're going to hear people talk about the shipping option. And that is because whether you're talking about the Northern Sea Route above Russia, the Northwest Passage above Canada, both of those routes are shorter than the Suez or the Panama. And so there's interest in, well, if it's shorter, does that mean it might be less expensive to ship? And does that mean that there will be more shipping there or at least an alternative to, as we experienced recently with the Suez Canal, uh, what happens if there are blockages or if there are uh, initiatives that are in the security realm that make some of those other routes less viable? Well, Russia is certainly promoting this as an option. And they are what I would describe as very enthusiastic about the Northern Sea Route, or sometimes called the Northeast Passage, as being the connection between Europe and Asia, and more directly for Russian interests between Russian oil and gas production in the Amal Peninsula and Asia. So we are seeing a lot of promotion and we are seeing a lot of investment by Russia in the Northern Sea Route in terms of infrastructure to try to make sure that to the extent companies around the world are interested in alternatives to the Panama and Suez, that they will take the Northern Sea Route as a safe option. So there's a lot of promotion, there's a lot of enthusiasm, but there's also still a lot of work that needs to be done to make this really a safe option. There's a lot of infrastructure that hasn't been built to make it a safer place. Honestly, it's still a short season. I mean, the ice does come back in the winter time and we need better navigation, never better charting, better communication to really have this be a safe alternative. A great example of that recently uh, before this LNG tanker took off from the Yamal Peninsula area, there was a lot of promotion about how it was going to be the first ever LNG tanker through the Northern Sea Route in winter. Well, a couple weeks out, um, the systems failed on board the LNG tanker and it is now in, in France getting repaired. So it didn't turn out quite the way they had hoped, but it illustrates that there isn't a lot of infrastructure along the way to repair things. Uh, unfortunately, if something goes wrong, you have to go quite a distance to get things fixed. Having said that, there is unquestionably going to be more shipping on a regional basis. And we are already seeing that between Europe and the uh, Northeast of the United States uh, with Unskip putting their North American headquarters into Portland, Maine. We will see more of that unquestionably, and as time goes by, perhaps even transshipment. We, not only the US, but all of the nations of the Arctic, as well as the shipping nations of the world, well, here's a short list of things that really need to be worked on if we're going to make this a winner versus a loser for the shipping industry and for the people of the region. How about tourism? Tourism was really growing before the pandemic hit. 
And we saw an increase in, in Svalbard and in Greenland and in Iceland and in Canada and in Russia and in Alaska. And it was on that trajectory. Obviously, things have stalled out for the time being, but I expect that will come back. Uh, even trips to the North Pole. One of the trips I took in 2017 was as a lecturer on board a Russian nuclear icebreaker called the 50 Years of Victory. And I might note that about 40% of the people, uh, the tourists on board the ship were from mainland China. Uh, there's a great deal of interest in the Arctic evolving in China and in Asia. Some of its curiosity, some of its research and science, some of its economics, uh, but it was one of those trips where you sort of say, yes, this is an international space where people will keep coming back if it's safe for them to do so. How about mining? Mining is also something that you will hear a lot about because of speculation associated with the rare earth minerals in Greenland, but not only in Greenland, in other places in the Arctic as well. And there have already been a lot of interest by countries like China and Australia and the United States in Greenland and in trying to help Greenlanders develop some of their resources. And I will just say Greenland's very interested because of course, they want as much independence as possible and see it as an economic necessity to develop some of their resources. And I noticed just a, a month or two ago, a, an a, allegiance, so to speak, of some of the countries like New Zealand and Canada and the US and the UK coming together to try to put together a package of investment that would make mineral opportunities not only good for Greenland, but possibly good for the countries that are investing as well. How about fishing? As I mentioned, it's an ocean. So of course, fishers are of uh, interest and we already see a lot of fishing in the Arctic, at least in territorial waters close to shore. There will be winners and losers. So here's an example of a country that was definitely a winner as fish moved north. So Iceland, which had largely depended on things like shrimp and capital, but others as well, all of a sudden had a bonanza of mackerel as they moved north. And that quickly became one of their largest fisheries. So again, the northern movement of fish has and potentially will continue to benefit some areas. Uh, in Alaska, we've seen both winners and losers. And the concern about how much ocean acidification may impact not just the shell fishing or, or the shell companies, but also the salmon because of the prey species of the salmon certainly are of concern. And closer to home there in Dartmouth, obviously uh, along the coast, you've seen huge changes in the last decade in terms of the decline of cod and the movement of lobster north, uh, but also concern about shell aquaculture and the rate of ocean acidification. Oil and gas. Well, when this study came out in 2009 and the price of oil was really high, there was a great deal of conversation about oil and gas in the Arctic and the potential that that might provide not only to the countries of the Arctic, but to their near neighbors for supply. Again, in this case, you see winners and losers. Arctic nations with oil and gas potential saw this as potential revenue and, and job creation, but also recognize that the possibility of oil spills in the Arctic, frankly, was terrifying because of how almost impossible it is to clean up oil in icy waters and in the challenging conditions of the Arctic. Uh, and it's also kind of a, a strange phenomenon, right, to want to develop a resource that is contributing to fossil fuel emissions and contributing to climate change, the setting in motion the very forces that make challenging the life for the people of the Arctic as well as the world. And recognizing that there are significant challenges associated with 
doing business, doing any kind of industrial activity in the Arctic, it was also a reason for some countries to take a pause and say, you know, maybe it's not the place that we should be doing oil and gas development. Canada and the US both came out in 2016 and said, no, we're just not going to do it anymore, at least offshore. And then, of course, in the last few years in the United States, we saw a reversal of that policy and an intention by the federal government to reopen the Arctic. But we are once again in the Biden administration seeing the same kind of concern that was registered back in 2016 about the hazards associated with development there. Norway goes back and forth. Norway has a, been an oil producer for a long time. And let's remember the Arctic of Norway is quite different than the Arctic of Alaska uh, because of the conditions that basically keep the waters off of Norway ice-free during the winter. It is a less challenging situation in that regard, uh, but it's still a controversial topic even in Norway. The one country of the Arctic that is what I would describe as all in when it comes to oil and gas development in the Arctic is Russia. And that's maybe not surprising because that's where so much of their oil and gas resources are. And it is, of course, an important part of their economy. So Russian oil and gas development is expanding in the region and it is being invested in heavily by others, China, France, and other partners. And as a result of that, you are seeing a great deal of construction, particularly in the Yamal Peninsula. Uh, and as a result of that, we're already seeing a lot more product being shipped out of Russia to both Asia and to Europe. Uh, this will continue. So, that's a very brief overview of some of the winners and losers, both in the Arctic and globally. What I wanna to transition to in sort of the last part of my remarks today are what are a few of the geopolitical implications of what I have just talked about. And again, this is a subject that deserves a lot more time but I do want to talk briefly about it because there is a lot of media coverage of this notion of great power competition returning to the Arctic and tensions returning to the Arctic and military investments being increased in the Arctic. And I want to give you a little bit of context so that when you see media reports like that, you have a little broader view of what's really happening on, on both sort of the, the good and the bad side of that equation. So back in 2013, we had this rather um, impactful speech from President Putin about how much more attention Russia was going to play, pay to the Arctic, both infrastructure development for civilian and for military. And Believe me, since then, there has been a lot more investment by Russia in the Arctic on both sides of that equation. The buildup of military assets has been pretty dramatic. And we're talking about submarines, we're talking about icebreakers, we're talking about uh, air power, we're talking about additional um, bases being built we're talking about many more military exercises, some of them very close to their neighbors. And that understandably uh, has generated a lot of a speculation about why. Is it just to protect the homeland? Is it just a sense of identity and history associated with the Russian Arctic? Is it because of concerns about the NATO uh, powers, the other, those of the other Arctic nations that are associated with NATO? Is it about protecting their oil and gas or their Northern Sea Route? Uh, there are, there's a lot of speculation and, and many good articles have been written, but I would say that the impact has been antagonizing some of its Arctic neighbors and the impact has been strengthening some of its business partnerships 
with other countries like China that very much want to do business and want to have access to the resources of the Russian Arctic. As I mentioned, it has created also some alarm among near neighbors. Norway has pumped up its military investment and has issued a number of statements over the last six to nine months uh, expressing concern about the military exercises that have been conducted. And Sweden, a number of years ago, brought back conscription. Again, you'll, you can find in media reports concern expressed. Uh, again, the near neighbors of the North have a reason to be concerned. And if you look at the United States, whether you're talking about all the way back to 2013 or more recently 2018 uh, with this statement um, or last two years from the Secretary of Navy and from the Vice Commandant of the Coast Guard, an increasing amount of attention, investment and concern about what is changing in the Arctic in a way that has the potential, not yet the reality, but the potential to destabilize what has been, relatively speaking, a very peaceful and collaborative uh, area of the world. Uh, as actually as recently as this week, a uh, Northcom statement about defending our interests in the Arctic and making certain that we have the assets necessary, we, the United States, to be able to be prepared. We have certainly seen an increase in military investments in the Alaskan Arctic, uh, mostly in air power, although we are now seeing a desire and some investment in replacing our aging uh, Coast Guard vessels, the Healy and the Star, and, and uh, all need replacing. They're, they're very old and there's now money to build new ships, which is a good thing, but it, also is showing up in terms of strategy. And both the Navy and the Army have just this spring released new Arctic strategy documents that talk about not only investments that need to be made, but training and awareness and coordination of both military, civilian, state of Alaska, and near neighbor collaboration. So these articles that you read about great power competition, you can look at what I have just talked about in terms of military investment and maybe conclude that that's a fair description. Um, you can look at some of the speeches that have been made. Secretary Pompeo back in Finland in 2019 and his speech that basically called out this Russian, China, US triangle and concern about what that might mean and concern particularly about China because China, although it's not an Arctic state, declared itself a near Arctic state when it came out with its Arctic policy in 2018, which certainly raised a few eyebrows. Um, and it's not actually just that statement, it's the fact that over the last decade or so, China has also been doing much more research. It has two icebreakers now on which it, it uses those as a platform for research, not for anything else to the best of my knowledge. And as I said, the investment that China has been making, not just in Russia, but also in Greenland and in Canada and in Iceland, and even in Norway and in the United States, demonstrating an increased interest in not only having partnerships, for access to resources, partnerships in terms of research and diplomacy. Um, we have, we, there's a lot of evidence of that and that has raised questions. Uh, I would say that it's not terribly surprising to me that China has an interest in the Arctic. Actually, I think the whole planet has an interest in the Arctic, not only because of many of the things that I've talked about before, weather, climate, sea level rise, et cetera, but also because of the economic interests. China's interests are largely in shipping, it's in resources, it's in building up di di diplomatic relationships. And it's also in changes in the environment. Um, there's been research that shows how much these, this 
less than stable jet stream and these longer periods of cold or hot or drought also has parked smog for longer periods of time over communities like Shanghai. Uh, and so concern about how Arctic warming is impacting even China, it's not a surprise to me that they want to do research. It's also not a surprise to me that they wanna do something about climate change. And so as recently as a few days ago, when former Secretary of State John Kerry, now a special envoy, met with his equivalent leaders in China to talk about climate change, uh, I, I give this as an example of how important it is that we continue to look for the ways in which the other countries of the world who are interested in the Arctic actually have an interest that is legitimate that we can partner with. So in closing, I just wanna remind us that overall, there is more of a strong case to be made for cooperation in the Arctic than there is in great power competition. And here's just the short list of 10 things. Uh, briefly, I'll go through, you know, the Arctic Council has been the standard of cooperation for the Arctic nations. It has worked for the last 25 years to engage with the indigenous people of the region and to find areas of compromise and cooperation to build consensus on agreements like oil spill response and search and, and rescue and scientific research. It has created relationships at the level of like our Coast Guards to be able to respond in emergency. And, and this continues even between the US and Russia as recently as uh, last month, actually in February, the revised agreement between Russia and the US on maritime safety in the Bering Strait. And the fisher, fisheries agreement that has basically brought the countries, the major fishing countries of the world to the table to agree not to fish in the Central Arctic Ocean until we know more about that ecosystem and might possibly be able to sustainably manage a fishery there. Uh, you know, there are laws in place that help guide where we go, even in terms of the extended continental shelf claims. So I don't think that the media coverage that wants to make you believe that there's more controversy than there is cooperation, I don't think it's something that one should hear and not realize that there are many ways in which science diplomacy, many ways in which mutual and self-interest come together to really make the Arctic what it is, a place of mostly peace and cooperation. So in summary, this region's changing rapidly. Those changes have dramatic implications, both locally, regionally, and globally. The changes that are taking place will create, yes, both winners and losers, but the dynamism, the rate of change, the complexity of these systems and these changes make predictions very, very difficult. So thanks again for inviting me today. Thanks to all of you for tuning in and listening and thanks for continuing to care about a region that is very dynamic and very impactful for all of us. Back to you, Matt. Thank you, Fran. That was just fantastic. As uh, uh, amazing. Uh, so I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Melody. Melody, take it away. Sure, thank you. And this is the time for all of uh, the participants we see. Um, if you would put uh, any questions, uh, go ahead to put those in the Q&A at the bottom of the webinar, and we will choose a few um, in the time we have left, next 10 minutes. Ooh quite a big one um, coming in. So uh, let me see if I can look at this one as I ask it. Um, we have a question that uh, from one of our watchers that says, President Biden has emphasized his commitment to environmental justice and dedication to net zero emissions no later than 2050. Where does this ambitious goal now leave those net residents of the Arctic? Is it going to be enough to advance this, uh, to address the advancing Arctic crisis? Well, we have to realize that we have baked in a lot of warming already. So everything we do today to achieve the goal for 
2030, 2050, pick your number, is important to do. But it doesn't flip the switch of change to all of a sudden save all the sea ice, save the Greenland ice sheets, save the glaciers. And that's, on the one hand, a sad statement to make because I, I wish I had that power. I wish that President Biden had that power. But we have to recognize that because of the way in which the planetary system works, we have to take steps to make change happen now as soon as possible. But so many of the changes are going to continue to happen. And so for the people of the Arctic, adaptation is essential. I actually would say for the people of the world, adaptation is essential. And we have to do both. We have to remember, we have to do everything we can to reduce emissions and slow warming. And we have to do everything that we can in downscaling the climate models, understanding the changes and making the necessary plans and investments right now so that we can adapt with minimal negative impacts to humanity. Thank you. Um, many questions coming in for you, just so you know. The next one I was going to ask you is, um, what ways do you suggest for faculty, let's say, to advise students in the US who are interested in the Arctic and trying to be involved in Arctic policy? What would you advise? How do we get students involved? Or sh should we get students involved? Well, I love getting students involved. Um, and as, as you know, I'm, I'm at Harvard and we have a number of graduate students at the Kennedy School who have taken a particular interest in this region. And I suspect that it's true not only for Harvard and for Dartmouth, but for many places because it's a place that's changing so fast. So instead of studying an area that's kind of been the same for a long time, it looks like it might be the same for a while, the Arctic is so dynamic that it really inspires creativity and invention. And I think that's why it appeals to some students and why I am grateful that they are interested because we need new ideas. We need new ways of exploring the topics of the Arctic. It's not, as I said, the 21st century Arctic is so different from the 20th century Arctic. And I think those of us who have been doing this for a while sometimes maybe get stuck even though we don't want to. Whereas students see the world that can be, not just the world that was. So how can they get involved other than participating in seminars, reading, listening? There are a number of programs around that encourage innovation. And I would say whether it's under the auspices of an organization like the Arctic Council and some of its working groups, or whether it is working for an NGO or a university, there's a lot of space for you to add your new bright ideas to help solve some of these problems. Thank you. And another question coming in is specifically about back to the idea of the uh, larger global, global climate um, policies, if the US is moving those forward. Are those policies also, do they need to be more thoughtful about the indigenous communities of the Arctic and really tailor some of these grand plans for the, the globe um, to the environmental justice of, of understanding the Arctic populations and the native uh, Alaskan populations? So the question is, could that, could that look a little different, those grand policy plans for global warming at the local scale and how? Yes, climate justice is a tremendous challenge for not just the United States, but I would say for all of the Arctic nations, but it's broader than that. For every nation where we see indigenous people at the front lines of feeling the imminent threats and the harm associated with a warming climate and these changing conditions, whether it's sea level rise or coastal erosion or whatever. Yes, this is hard work. I mean, it's easier to say what I just said than it is to do what needs to be done. Because again, you have to do it at every level. You have to have these big, global, bold, ambitious goals that deal with the global picture. But as I was saying about adaptation, you also have to take it to the level of the village that is trying to move and there's no governance structure to help them do that. And that's, again, not unique to our country. I mean, you could make the case globally. Uh, I don't 
I, I don't know what the answer to this question is, but we need those of us who are taking the time to understand these issues, need to add our voices of support to building out governance structures and financing structures that will really help meet people where they're at for not, not only indigenous people, but for all coastal communities. Well, thank you. And that may lead to the last question is the, uh, as you just mentioned with the geopolitics, the. Uh, um, the Russian Federation will be host will be the next chair of the Arctic Council. So there's this opportunity both with the to really think about the future of, as you mentioned, science diplomacy and diplomacy and governance. Um, how do you see the next two years moving forward under the Russian Arctic Council? And are you optimistic that we can address some of these issues uh, together? Well, fundamentally, I am an optimist. So I'm going to take the upside of this and say that. You know, when a country chairs the Arctic Council, they know that the spotlight is on them. And it's really a temptation to do the best job you can to put your best foot forward. And in a time when there's so much attention on climate change and so much attention on things like reducing plastic pollution in the Arctic Ocean and attention to things like trying to reduce heavy fuel oil use in the Arctic, it would be a great time for Russia to show its better side and to say, yes, we wanna be part of the global solution set and um, not simply embrace the 20th century, but move forward into the 21st. So I'm going to be hopeful that this chairmanship opportunity does that for Russia, for the Arctic and for the world. And before we close, I wanna say one more time, thanks so much for this opportunity and thanks so much to all of you at Dartmouth who do such great work on Arctic issues. Thank you so much for being with us. I can't thank you enough. It's just been an amazing experience. You covered so much ground and uh, I think uh, everyone who is here has learned so much. So we hope to have you back when things change um, in person. And uh, again, we appreciate your time. Thank you from Dartmouth and thank you from the Dickey Center. Thank you from the Institute of Arctic Studies and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye everyone.